champion, the political science and world politics librarian, and coordinator of the House of Learning Lectures. We welcome students, colleagues, faculty, and invited guests here today to hear Professor Matt Holland from the Department of Political Science deliver today's House of Learning Lecture entitled, How to Think About the First Great American, Hawthorne's Suggestion. The library sponsors two main lectures and lecture series the House of Learning Lectures, and the Alice Louise Reynolds Women in Scholarship Lecture. Through these lectures, the library brings together scholars and students to engage in a civil discussion of ideas. And in so doing, the library contributes to building a learned community which fosters the faithful life of the mind. The House of Learning Lecture series title is taken from the 88th section of the Doctrine and Covenants, verse 119, where the Lord instructs the saints to prepare every needful thing, even a house of learning. Because the library is the campus repository for the literature of all academic disciplines and scholarship, the library is well positioned to be considered BYU's house of learning. The Harold B. Lee Library takes seriously its campus role as the intellectual heart of inquiry and knowledge and is honored to provide this house of learning lecture today. Now, about today's lecturer. Few have BYU in their blood quite like Professor Holland. As a youth, his father was president of the university, and it was from BYU that uh, Professor Holland earned his first degree in political science with honors in 1991, and was also that year's college valedictorian. Following the completion of that degree, he spent a year as a Raoul Wallenberg scholar at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. In 1998, he earned a Master of Arts degree from Duke University, and in 2001 received his PhD degree also from Duke, whereupon he returned to Provo and to BYU. During the academic year 2005-2006, Professor Holland was an Ann and Herbert W. Vaughn Fellow in the James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions at Princeton University and in 2007 participated in the Transatlantic Ideas of the American Founding Conference at the University of Edinburgh. He is the author of the 2007 book, Bonds of Affection, Civic Charity and the Making of America, published by Georgetown University Press, and has over a dozen articles and conference presentations to his credit. In addition to his scholarly achievements, Professor Holland is an apt mentor to BYU students, compassionate, caring, and enthusiastic for the faithful life of the mind. It gives great pleasure to welcome today's House of Learning lecturer, Professor Matt Holland. Well, thank you, Dr. Champion. Uh, it's a great uh, pleasure and honor to be with you today. I suppose the first thing that I need to do is um, reveal who I think the first great American is. Uh, for anyone wondering, let me make it clear it's not Eliot Spitzer. Uh, um, this is a conclusion I came to after completing a, a book uh, that I just uh, published that Dr. Champion referenced, Bonds of Affection, Civic Charity and the Making of America where the first person I look at is John Winthrop. To my mind, and the mind of more and more political scientists and historians, the first great American is John Winthrop. For those of you fuzzy on who this is, rest assured, you're not alone. As I explained to my students, John Winthrop is the most important American that most Americans don't know about. 
an attorney and respected man of means of Suffolk County, England. John Winthrop was elected governor of the Massachusetts Bay Company uh, in 1629 at the age of 44. By the spring of 1630, he was on board the Arbella, sailing to America in the earliest phase of the great migration of English Puritans to the New World. Winthrop remained governor until 1634 and was later reelected to the office eight more times. During this roughly 20-year period, he settled Boston, skillfully held together the sprawling frontier settlements of Massachusetts in the face of harsh winters, economic downturns, conflicts with native uh, populations and foreign powers. He also took a leading role in creating the first confederation of American colonies, the United Colonies of New England. Through all of this, he kept a journal that remains one of our single richest sources of New England history. But even all this fails to capture the full, win the full impact of Winthrop, excuse me, but even all this fails to capture the full picture of Winthrop and his impact. Sometime just before the Arbella set sail for America, Winthrop, speaking as governor, delivered a lay sermon to his fellow travelers. With remarkable theoretical sophistication, he articulated a public philosophy that he hoped would serve as the organizing ideal of civic life in the new world. His was a vision of Massachusetts as, quote, a model of Christian charity, unquote, the common title of his remarks. Whatever one may think of the particular religious framework and the demands of Winthrop's concept of love in this address, the result is a compelling vision of community. As Winthrop describes it at one point, all the parts of this body being thus united are made so contiguous and in a special relation as they must needs partake of each other's strength and infirmity, joy and sorrow, weal and woe. If one member suffers, all suffer with it. If one be in honor, all rejoice with it. The sensibleness and sympathy of each other's conditions will necessarily infuse, uh, excuse me, will necessarily infuse into each part of the native, uh, part of a native desire and endeavor to strengthen, defend, preserve, and comfort each other. Winthrop memorializes the thrust of this message in a lasting image he borrows from the Sermon on the Mount. Such a community, he concludes, would be an, a, become an example for all succeeding plantations, worthy of great praise and glory. It would become, he finally exults, a city upon a hill. Today, prominent scholars across a range of disciplines praise Winthrop's address as the most famous text in 17th century American history, the Ur text of American literature, and a distinctive and sophisticated piece of political philosophy from someone who, quote, stands at the beginning of our consciousness, unquote. In a 1999 special millennial issue of the New York Times, Peter Gomes, resident theologian and minister of Harvard University's Memorial Church, called it the greatest sermon of the last thousand years and a stirring vision for America that still lives. That major political leaders from John Adams to Bill Clinton, including almost every president and presidential aspirant since John Kennedy, have explicitly appropriated Winthrop's name and speech to chart national aspirations and identity only underscores the point. Despite such a contribution, the name John Winthrop currently registers little, if at all, with the vast majority of Americans. This is perhaps best explained by the success of a string of influential 19th and 20th century critics who recognized the lasting influence of American Puritanism in general, but emphasized in varying degrees that this was a very bad thing. The success of these critics has broadly turned America's prevailing image of Puritan New England into a caricature, a land of witches and witch hunters, of killjoys and tall crowned hats, whose main occupation was to prevent each other from having fun and whose sole virtue lay in their furniture. Over time, these concerted efforts to repudiate Puritanism's legacy has broadly diminished Winthrop's prominence in the national pantheon making him indeed, as the subtitle of one of his most recent and best biographies, America's Forgotten Founding Father. Of course, at the headwaters of this tradition, excoriating our Puritan past, stands one book, perhaps no piece of writing, historical or fictional, 
has so captured and defined an American era the way the scarlet letter has our Puritan heritage. The picture that many Americans have of this world they have almost entirely from a high school reading of this text. To know only this text, though, is to know much. In addition to his obvious literary genius, Hawthorne devoured an array of primary and secondary literature on the New England Puritans. Arguably, he remains he who knew them best. If so, this would seem to foster a view of, Winth of Winthrop's colonial reign and lasting influence as a massive and embarrassing tragedy, thereby justifying our national amnesia concerning this dominant early figure. But is this what Hawthorne would have wanted? There is reason to believe it is not. At a minimum, it must be acknowledged that Hawthorne's novel provides a withering critique of the Massachusetts Bay Colony's effort to become a model of Christian charity, the inaugural vision and founding aim of John Winthrop's leadership. In making this critique, Hawthorne is especially hard on Boston's rulers. Consider that of the adulteress Hester Prynne. Hawthorne writes that eventually there was none so ready as Hester to give of her little substance to every demand of poverty. Even though the bitter-hearted pauper threw back a jibe in requital of the food brought, Hester's nature showed itself warm and rich, a wellspring of human tenderness, unfailing to very real demand and inexhaustible by the largest. Her breast with its badge of shame was but the softer pillow for the head that needed one. She was a self-ordained sister of mercy. Contrast that with, with what Hawthorne says about the leaders of this community. The rulers and the wise and learned men of the community were longer in acknowledging the influence of Hester's good qualities than the people were. The prejudices which they shared in common with the latter were fortified in themselves by an iron framework of reasoning that made it far tougher labor to expel them. Thus it was that men of rank, on whom their eminent position imposed the guardianship of public morals, uh, individuals in private life, meanwhile, had quite forgiven Hester Prynne for her frailty. While rank-and-file Puritans largely come to forgive Hester and recognize her patient and forgiving goodness, the text only holds out the slimmest hope that in the due course of years, Boston's hardened leaders might develop an expression of almost benevolence toward Hester. As the unsparing enforcers of the community's covenant with God, these leaders appear to be able to uh, appear unable to appreciate in Hester and embrace themselves human expressions of Christian love. However, even as Hawthorne levels this accusation against the Puritan regime and its rulers, he seems to refrain from tarring John Winthrop in precisely the same way. Our first clue is Winthrop's striking absence from the text. The novel opens with Governor Bellingham presiding over Hester's trial on the town scaffolding. Hester's next interaction with a political figure is roughly three years later, and the leader is again Bellingham, no longer governor, but still holding an honorable and an influential place among the colonial magistracy. Ostensibly delivering a pair of gloves he ordered from her, Hester, the seamstress, had more pressing matters on her mind. Among those leaders known for cherishing the more rigid orders of principle and religion and government, there was supposedly a movement led by Bellingham himself to deprive Hester custody of Pearl, the offspring of her illicit affair. The first time the reader even encounters Winthrop's name is in chapter 12, the minister's vigil, where it is noted that Hester and Pearl have just been watching at the Governor Winthrop's deathbed. This comment is significant in that it offers the novel's one established date. Winthrop's death on March 26, 1649 is a matter of firm historical record. And from this, we can determine that Hester's trial transpired in June of 1642. But this raises several peculiarities. First, Hawthorne makes Bellingham the governor for the novel's opening when in historical fact Winthrop was. Winthrop actually succeeded Bellingham in May of 1642. Second, even though Winthrop dominated the actual stage of Boston politics during the time frame of the novel, Winthrop was governor when the novel opens in 1642 until 1644, uh, and then again from 1646 to 1649. 
the year he died and the novel ends. Hawthorne makes uh, Bellingham the political figure instead, the focal political figure instead. Third, when Boston appears at its very worst, most rigid and tyrannical, when the leaders threaten to take Pearl away from Hester, is during the two-year gap when Winthrop was not governor. If Hester seeks out Bellingham three years after her trial, it would be 1645, and Iron John Endicott was in charge. Well, with respect to the first two points, most scholars agree that Hawthorne was too historically aware and meticulous to make such moves by mistake. One explanation is that Hawthorne intentionally commits these inaccuracies to highlight Puritan hypocrisy. Historical records, Hawthorne knew, suggest Bellingham himself engaged in an illicit sexual relationship. Thus, Hawthorne makes Hester's most powerful and punishing judge guilty of something approximating, approximating the crime she is forced to admit. This argument is persuasive, but if Hawthorne were only interested in establishing this irony, why not avoid the historical accuracy altogether and open the novel in April, when Bellingham was in fact governor? The argument also fails to address other curiosities. Most notably, why would Hester and Pearl linger at the bedside of the dying Winthrop in the middle of the night? As seamstress of choice for the elite, Hester was there to take a measure for Winthrop's burial robe. But why must she be there with her daughter, watching through the night? Hester might have been summoned to come and take measurements more quickly, or even just after Winthrop passed away, and in either case, without her daughter following her into the chamber. Any such scenario seems more logical and appropriate than having the single most important man in the colony surrounded in his final moments in the middle of the night, the night by a convicted adulteress and her illegitimate daughter. Another factor that makes Hester's vigil perplexing is the identity of the other people at the bedside. One of the other watchers was Reverend Wilson, the man who most publicly and aggressively confronted Hester in the opening scene as touching the vileness and blackness of her sin. The other was Dr. Chillingsworth, he, he, Hester's secret and wronged husband, who was self-destructively bent on destroying her and her former lover, Reverend Dimsdale. Hester and Pearl avoided Wil uh, Wilson and Chillingsworth, especially Chillingsworth, whenever possible. Yet here they stand side by side with them through the night. What, besides a deep admiration and affection for Winthrop, could possibly explain this extremely unusual scene? And what is the reader to make of all the heavenly imagery that surrounds Winthrop's death? In chapter 12, Reverend Wilson is shrouded in a kind of radiant halo. Though the light obviously comes from the lantern he is carrying, the imaginative suggestion is that it was as if the departed governor had left him an inheritance of his glory as Winthrop triumphantly passed into the distant shine of the celestial city. When Dinsdale later thinks he's seeing a blazing A in the sky, an imaginative thought again redounds in Winthrop's favor. The next day, a sexton asks Dimsdale, but did your reverence hear of the portent that was seen last night? A great red letter in the sky, the letter A, which we interpret to stand for angel. For as our good governor Winthrop was made an angel this past night, it was doubtless held fit that there should be some notice thereof. Hawthorne could not possibly intend us to think of Winthrop only in angelic light. Hawthorne was never so literal and someone so vitally bound up with the establishment of the Puritan regime under vigorous attack could not entirely escape Hawthorne's indictment. This is especially true since in Winthrop's classic sermon, A Model of Christian Charity, one sees on full display, side by side with the warm and inspiring calls to sympathy and generosity, the logic of religious paranoia that led that early community to constantly worry over and ex excessively punish even rather minor sins. Yet, it now seems equally implausible that Hawthorne would have us believe that the A blazoned across the sky symbolizes Winthrop as a kind of antichrist, as some have suggested. Hawthorne works too hard to put Winthrop out of sight when the worst things are happening. And when Winthrop does appear, the purely heavenly imagery surrounding him differs sharply with, broad, with broadly hostile pictures of other leaders. Finally, the perplexing, lingering presence of Hester and Pearl 
at Winthrop's deathbed would seem to betoken a warm, appreciative relationship between the governor and these two figures of public scorn. Together, these things raise the strong suggestion that one of America's greatest observers and severest critics of uh, severest critics saw John Winthrop as a political ruler with some genuinely redeeming traits and insights. More evidence for this speculative claim can be found elsewhere in Hawthorne's literature. In Main Street, Endicott and the Red Cross, and Mrs. Hutchison, Winthrop is consistently portrayed as a man by whom the innocent and the guilty might alike desire to be judged, the first confiding in his integrity and wisdom, the latter hoping in his mildness. Quietly but repeatedly, Hawthorne's fiction exonerates Winthrop from the accusation of being a figure of malevolence. In Hawthorne's story, Winthrop emerges again and again with his humanity intact. Such a view also appears quite consistent with most modern scholarly treatments of Winthrop's life. From Edmund Morgan to Francis J. Bremer, Winthrop's best chroniclers cannot help but emphasize his reputed generosity, moderation, courage, and set of accomplishments that point in the direction of widely embraced con contemporary ideals. Even just a quick gloss on those accomplishments is revealing. On his watch, considerable care was rendered to the poor. For those unable to support themselves in that somewhat infertile and hostile wilderness, a solid mix of public and private support was provided even when the colony was highly impoverished. Winthrop himself proved especially giving of his own energies and substance. Despite his high station in that aristocratic age, something of which he was ever conscious, he was noted for wearing plain apparel and for working side by side with his servants and the rest of the colonists, setting an example such that there was not an idle person to be found in the whole plantation. After the colony's first harsh, harsh winter, when roughly 200 settlers perished and promised funding from England vanished upon the news, Winthrop spent a considerable amount of his own modest fortune to sustain the colony. In the model speech, Winthrop is emphatic that there remains a firm Christian command to love even an enemy, to do good to them that hate you. Winthrop is repeatedly on record for making diligent efforts to maintain relations of peace and affection with those who opposed him personally and the colony in general. The kind of virulent anti-Catholic statements so common throughout England at the time are noticeably absent from Winthrop's writings. Until the day he died, Roger Williams, one of the most famous internal dissenters of Winthrop's Boston, spoke hardly anything but fondness and praise for Winthrop, who, actively, who was actively involved in expelling Williams from Boston for his increasingly radical separatism. And with respect to early Boston's religious and racial other, Winthrop and his crowd did better than most imagine. Winthrop's own journal records a number of amicable exchanges with Native Americans, including hosting them in his home overnight, and he inflicted strict punishment against any colonists guilty of mistreating them. Winthrop's Massachusetts was also more enlightened than most all the rest of the colonies in its treatment of African Americans. Massachusetts honored slave marriages before the law, afforded the slaves right to trial by jury, and forbade masters from inflicting arbitrary punishment. Most significantly, African Americans were admitted to local congregations on the same basis as white applicants. In his journal, Winthrop praises a Negro maid who had shown knowledge and true godliness and was received for baptism. Maybe most influential of all was the contribution Winthrop and the Puritans made to America's culture of democracy and law. In the model speech and elsewhere, Winthrop is clear. The work of setting up both civil and ecclesiastical power must be done by, quote, mutual consent, unquote. The Puritans made the state and even the church answerable to the people, not vice versa. To that end, one of his first major moves as governor was to expand the franchise. Furthermore, spurred on by certain Calvinist teachings and the kind of persecution that the Puritans experienced from England's fusion of civil and ecclesiastical power, Massachusetts, under Winthrop's leadership, laid out a remarkably well-defined separation of church and state. Church discipline could not impose corporal or civil punishment. Not a single clergyman held office, despite the fact that there was no law that forbade such. 
civil government took exclusive jurisdiction over wills, divorces, and marriage ceremonies. No ecclesiastical courts even existed. Furthermore, it is Winthrop's Massachusetts that first draws and then it peacefully expels Roger Williams, whose determination to establish in Rhode Island a hedge or wall of separation between the garden of the church and the wilderness of the world even more closely prefigures the church-state position of a Jefferson a century and a half later. And over time, primarily on Winthrop's watch, though not always with his fullest support, Massachusetts developed a ruling bicameral legislative body of rudimentary, che of rudimentary checks and balances between a larger popular assembly of deputies and a smaller aristocratic assembly of assistants, anchored by a written body of fundamental liberties, making it one of the most democratic entities in the world at the time. And all of this wrought in a state of nature a good a half century before Locke <coughs> would publish his second treatise. So where does Hawthorne finally leave us? The first and most unmistakable point of the Scarlet Letter is that Hawthorne was not a Puritan and he would not have us be Puritans either. Given that Winthrop is so fundamentally linked with the genesis and proliferation of New England's Puritan experiment, Hawthorne could not possibly taken to believe him worthy of honor absent any serious reservation. While it does appear that Winthrop's personal applications of the principles of Christian love may have helped to redeem him in some degree in the eyes of Hawthorne, such a love cannot finally redeem the overly harsh, harsh civil structure that Winthrop helped to create, primarily because that structure is an expression of that love. Nowhere is the iron framework of reasoning that imposed a fairly inhumane guardianship of the public morals in 17th century Massachusetts as poetically and profoundly stated as it is in Winthrop's A Model of Christian Charity speech. One way to try to square this is to believe that Hawthorne simply saw Winthrop as a generally noble exception to a Puritanism that otherwise spawns only malevolence and despotism. But surely it was not lost on Hawthorne that Winthrop was more than a leader, more than one among many. Winthrop was the dominant figure of his age, repeatedly reelected to the community's highest elected office, and on a remarkably democratic basis. It was, but again, this was no mere democracy. It was a community with a telos, or an aim. Winthrop was thrust into the regime's most powerful position again and again, not simply on the promise of satisfying some aggregate of individual materialist preferences, but more significantly on the hope uh, but more significantly on the hope that he, better than anyone, could lead them to the practical realization of their idealized state. Rather than the exception to the rule, then, he appears to be very much one of them, but the best of them. To the degree that Hawthorne sees great goodness in Winthrop, he implicitly compliments the community that freely rewarded such a figure with unmatched political influence. It might also be remarked that in Hawthorne's literature in general, there is a special caution to those who would, in the name of aggressively refashioning the American polity, serve Winthrop up as irredeemable Cretan, as many have tried to do. Hawthorne rejected Puritanism in part because he embraced elements of it more profoundly than those who actually practiced it. He could see that Puritanism's extensive moral certainties and unsparing covenants were tragically at odds with the unfathomability of God and human imperfectibility Calvinists otherwise professed. From Georgiana's tiny but in ineradicable natural flaw in the birthmark to the picture of natural depravity of the human heart that closes Earth's holocaust, Hawthorne's fiction persistently comes down on the side of accepting human nature, flawed as it might be, as the tragic and, and immovable fact of human community. Thus, radical revisions of human character upon a secular, utopian design are no better and may even be worse in Hawthorne's eyes than Puritanism's religiously inspired radicalism. In the Blythedale Romance, the story of a group of people striving for an idealized life shorn of all market inequalities and the judgmentalism of American religion, Zenobia fares worse than her puritanical doppelganger, Hester Prynne. In the end, Zenobia commits suicide. T 
to fully and caustically condemn everything about Winthrop because of some demonstrable imperfections of thought and action would seem, by the light of Hawthorne's works, to replace one form of Puritanism with its ungenerous and uncompromising enforcement of an ideal moral order for another. Finally, it must be remarked that Hawthorne would appear also to have us welcome but not take uncritical comfort in the liberal democracy that grows out of but dramatically departs from Winthrop's world. As the Scarlet Letter closes, Hester, who fled the, to the supposedly more civilized and gentle grounds of England, returns to Boston to live out her days. In doing so, she continues of her own free will to wear her Scarlet A, even though the sternest magistrate of that period would not have insisted that she do so. And at this point, the badge of shame ceases to provoke scorn and bitterness, but evokes awe and reverence. While suggesting that both Hester and Boston had changed enough to make her living there preferable to living in the old world, this closing scene hardly redeems early Boston from the searing indictment of the novel's preceding pages. To the very end, Hester remains in Boston, but with sad eyes, looking forward to a future time when a new truth would be revealed to establish human relationships on a sure ground of mutual happiness. Of course, Hawthorne writes this knowing that a time will come, in fact, when a new self-evident truth will be declared, opening up the way for people to live together in the free pursuit of happiness. And few, if any, including Hawthorne, would dispute that the political morality of the Declaration of Independence establishes a polity that avoids many of the sweeping moral judgments that made Puritan life so unbearably grim and repressive. Yet it is often forgotten or completely missed that the Scarlet Letter opens in a custom house in 19th century America, not on a scaffolding in 17th century New England. And over the entrance of this civil post of Uncle Sam's government sits an ornamental eagle of which Hawthorne says, Many people are seeking at this very moment to shelter themselves under the wing of the federal eagle, imagining, I presume, that her bosom has all the softness and snugness of an eider-down pillow. But she has no great tenderness, even in her best moods, and sooner or later she is apt to fling off her nestlings with a scratch of her claw, a dab of her beak, or a ranking wound from her barbed arrows. Both Hester's ultimate return to Boston and this troubling description of the American polity of Hawthorne's day would seem to buttress the suggestion that we ought that we not utterly excoriate Winthrop and his model of charity in favor of some completely unbracketed commitment to modern liberal democracy. Hawthorne could view Winthrop not just with some sympathy but with a degree of admiration because Winthrop personally stood for and powerfully established a national mythos that humans are social beings, dependent upon other social beings, not just to survive, but to flourish. That humans live best when they live freely, but when they freely choose discipline ends beyond their own immediate creature comforts. The liberal core of American democracy, a national mythos itself, and one more dominant than that Winthrop established, often fails to teach us this and seemingly lacks the rhetoric, symbols, and imagery necessary to inspire such. On the other hand, liberal democracy appears an unmatched resource for mitigating the harsh intolerances and restrictions on freedom that always seem to follow in the wake of absolutist social doctrines like American Puritanism. Puritanism's relationship to modern democratic government in this country is manifold indeed. Its vices made a liberal republic necessary, while its virtues provided a variety of enabling conditions for that liberal uh, republic to develop. Little wonder then that someone like Hawthorne, so able to see beyond simplistic moral dichotomies, ultimately recognizes that alongside the array of disturbingly unfavorable influence be bequeathed by our Puritan forebears, there are many good ones. Even Hawthorne's birth in Salem, Massachusetts on the 4th of July, a symbolic mix too ironic for serious fiction, betokens his matured and ambivalent stance vis-a-vis -vis his own Puritan heritage. Let us thank God for having given us such ancestors, and let each successive generation thank him not less fervently 
for being one step further from them in the march of ages. The current identity of any political regime is tied to its past, especially the critical moments of its creation or founding. The notion that the cultural recollection of such moments always shapes, at least to some degree, a contemporary society's moral vision, sense of purpose, and capacity to act is an insight as old as Plato. If we look back and see that American Puritanism was the disease that philosophical liberalism had to cure, we should also take care to recognize that a memory fully flushed of every vestige of our Puritan beginnings may yet feel troubling symptoms stemming from the continued and aggressive application of the antidote alone. The moral, political, and intellectual conundrum this presents America today cannot be resolved in ideological sloganeering, nor is it likely to be broadly pursued by the larger public in sober academic inquiry. Thus, Hawthorne's still popular but datal fiction, especially The Scarlet Letter, offers America a great gift. By suggesting a portrait of Winthrop more consistent with the genuine complexities of his life, times, and concept of charity that we humanely reject even as we cherish, cherish its continued mediation of the better angels of our nature, the Scarlet Letter, if read and taught carefully, may provide a broad civic platform for recognizing that in this founding figure there is much to avoid but still something to admire. It's hard to imagine a better instrument for widely uh, excuse me, it's hard to imagine a better instrument for widely chastening current practices of blindly praising, mindlessly condemning, or worst of all, simply forgetting Winthrop and his two-edged significance for our full political tradition. Thank you. <laughs>